Let's talk about this example that I love, because I also love the cold. I did a lot of cold exposure, Wim Hof methods, and I was also swimming long distance uh, swimming in, in cold water. And um, let me tell you the, the full story. And, and again, uh, just my two cents as of today. If you go on Google, it, it's actually a paper that I've heard on uh, Nat Geo the first time, but if you go on Google and you type cold exposure and seek leave, works leave. The first paper you will get tons of reference to is a paper done in the Netherlands a few years ago with something like 4,000 participants. And indeed, in the title, as you really clearly suggested, it's written, it's a randomized control trial. Quentin, welcome. I'm really excited to have you. I've been looking forward to this conversation because I think we're going to be talking about a topic that typically is very technical, but I think really everyone should know about it. So do you want to start by introducing yourself and what it is you do? Yes, sure. So thanks a lot for, for having me. It's really a great pleasure. So in short, my, my passion, my obsession, <laughs> and my field of expertise is indeed the study of causality. Technically speaking, it's called causal inference. And uh, related to these fields that actually everybody should know about because it's tremendously useful for making decision, but we are going to talk more about this. So basically, um, I'm a postdoc researcher, so I got a PhD in economics, econometrics mostly, where I focused on statistics and causal inference. And over the last 10 years, I taught and did research in academia, specifically on this topic, where I used causal inference to answer big questions that were left unanswered. For example, what is the impact of sending weapons on the probability of conflict in the destination country, or what is the effect of COVID lockdowns on the spread of the virus. And uh, during those years, I had the, the opportunity to teach to about 12 to 13,000 students now, and from really a wide audience, from um, researchers in biomedical research, doing research with animals, to managers, and had a lot of contacts and more and more with people in the industry to help them make better decisions. So really glad to be here and to share this field that I love so much and that uh, should be very useful for your audience. And as a preview for everyone listening, we thought of structuring the conversation into three big segments, each tailored to a slightly different audience, or although hopefully of interest to all audiences. The first one being a causal inference for data scientists. The second one, causal inference for business owners and executives. And then the third one, causal inference for the general public. So starting with causal inference for data scientists, thinking about the average data science student, maybe an undergraduate, someone who's not a PhD in statistics or economics, why should they care about causal inference? Well, this will be basically a useful for, for everyone, this answer. Basically, causal inference is a very niche topic. It's really something that few people master and use. But surprisingly, it's something that's used everywhere, every day by anyone. Basically, as it's interested about measuring and co connecting cause and effects, most of our choices, our decisions that we make every day are based on causal chains. But very few people are trained to actually measure and prove that it's not just a correlation, an association, but it's indeed a causal link. And this leads to, to many costly mistakes. So for data scientists, it's really basically there are, I just recently wrote an article about this and, and posts. If you look for causal inference on Google Trends, it's really exploding in the recent years. There are more and more interests. It's very interesting because it comes at a time where people focus on AI a lot and on machine learning. And machine learning is mostly about predictive inference. You try to predict something based on what you observe. And causal inference is, is completely different. It's really you try to, to know what will happen if you change something. The logic is completely different. And hence, it's more 
the fact that this remains a niche topic, but it's useful everywhere, will really give a, a huge advantage on the job market to the people in data science who will learn this. Moreover, the, the really exciting part today merge the two worlds together. You have causal machine learning now. So if you know already a bit of machine learning or are interested and you add on top of this causal inference, you're really on the top in your field and you'll have a really great asset on the market. Could you give an example of a data science application where prediction could look like a good choice, but it actually isn't? Yes, so I might make some people angry about this, but basically where, where prediction is very important and used in data science is for uh, marketing. So basically you try, and some of the, the most famous models to or one type of model to assess the return on investment of marketing campaigns, which is a causal question, right? It's really you invest X and you get this in sales. So this is really a causal question. Well, basically, most of those algorithm consultants using those use predictive algorithm. If you take the, the main models made by Meta and Google engineers, it's lightweight mixed marketing models, um, LMMM, and uh, Robin, which is made by Meta, both are mostly predictive models. So basically, if you use this to just... A predictive model, you just look when you spend this much on ads, how much you get in return uh, on in sales, for example, on, on other KPIs. You can include some seasonality and other things. But still, if you fail to understand that this is not a causal model, it might be completely misleading. And if you fail to understand what is causal inference compared to predictive inference, you might not realize that you have a lot of confounding factors things that explain this relationship that you think that it's caused by the ads, but maybe actually it's caused by a, a change in the competition ad spending. Maybe it's due to some events on the market that correlates with your ad spending, actually. And, and so that's a big topic that, uh, where I, I talk a lot with people doing consulting, giving advice in MMM, uh, so mixed marketing models. And, and some people get it, and are, I'm talking a lot with uh, folks, I think they are based in India, uh, Arima Labs, where they used advanced econometrics and causal inference models jointly with mixed marketing models, and many others where they completely fail to understand this, and uh, in my opinion, gives very misleading advice to companies and, and clients. So from a data scientist point of view, something I sometimes encounter is that there's a lack of clarity in terms of where does the causal identification come from versus what is the tool. Because one thing is, how do we establish that we are actually measuring a causal effect, what we call identification in economics, at least. And then the other part is, what tool do we use to measure it? And there can be many tools ranging from simple comparison of means to very fancy machine learning based tools. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so the essence of causality and causal inference is so fascinating because one thing that might be frustrating to some, but actually that's one of the main reasons why I'm so passionate about this and why we need so tremendously more people involved in this is actually you cannot test, you cannot prove causality directly with a test. And that's fascinating. You, you can use statistics, you can do a lot of things, but it's not like you can run a statistical test, get a p-value, and it's uh, statistically significant or not, meaning that you have a, a causal effect or not. And, and why is that? Maybe let's, let's dive together now in really the, the bottom of this question of causal inference. So the thing is, to answer causal question conceptually, or let me take my, my usual example. Let's say, you have a, a headache. You start this podcast, you really want to focus, but you have a, a headache. So you decide to take a pill. And after 15 minutes, you, the headache is gone. You feel great. But if you're like me, potentially like us, like people working in causal defense, that's where you start questioning, right? Was it really the pill? Was it because I drank tea, because I took a nap, because I get some rest? And the thing is, it's impossible to know. It's impossible to know because all those effects are confounded. The world is very complex and hence you have always many things changing at the same time. 
This is what we call the unconfoundedness assumption. The fact that your effects should not be confounded with something else in order to be causal and not just correlational. The only way actually to perfectly measure causality will be to have parallel worlds, right? You have two parallel worlds. In one of the two worlds, I'm doing this podcast and I don't have, a, and I have a headache, but I don't take the pill. In the other, I take the pill. And only in this ideal situation, because there is just one thing that is different from the big bang to the podcast, which is the pill, the treatment. If you have a difference with your headache, it will be most certainly caused by the pill. But we don't have this. This is what we call the fundamental problem of causal inference. And this is why it's so fascinating because you can do a lot of things with statistics, with machine learning, with advanced models, but you can never test directly this assumption. And hence, related to your question directly, you have the tools that are tremendously useful. It can be very fancy, but also your domain knowledge, your understanding of exactly the type of question you're interested in is very important. Because if you see that fog in London is correlated with an increased number of deaths in London as well, you have to understand, okay, maybe in London it's polluted. When you have the fog, it keeps the pollution low, but maybe it's not this. When you have fog, it's also in winter, so it's colder. So you have to think and understand the world, how everything is related. So you have on one side the models that are useful, and on the other, you really have all your domain knowledge and expertise and understanding of the world that is equally useful. And I think that's that's something that's just beautiful and, and very exciting in causal inference. I'm not sure I answered your question. <laughs> you did, and what I'm hearing is that you can't be lazy to do causal inference, right? You can't just take data and throw it into a model. You really have to think about the mechanism that produced the data. And I've had conversations recently with people who are specialists in causal inference about is it going to be replaced by AI or not, right? Is this something we can easily automate? Do you have any thoughts on that? I love it. I work a lot on this. So one thing. So I have this app. I actually you created a personalized GPT where you can share an article, a graph, a statement, uh, something you heard, anything with the app, and it will question the causality of the statement. So I did this with Political, uh, and it's, it's really available. So people can go on my website, thecausalmindset.com, and they can play with the app. So this is something that you can implement. It's implementing my, my framework to question causality. And LLM, typically ChatGPT, are incredibly powerful. And I was very surprised with ChatGPT4 because it has this knowledge of the relationship between things. With the example of the fog in London and, and mortality, it was, it was finding all the potential alternative stories. Maybe it's not the fog, it's maybe it's darker, maybe it's in winter, maybe you have more accidents, maybe people stay at home and share germs, so it's not the pollution. So it was very, very fascinating, and that's why I leverage on, on this to create an app. What AI is not able to do yet, and potentially for, for a very long time still, is assessing causality, is going to step beyond. It's completely different to question causality and to assess causality. So you can spot some weaknesses, but then actually collecting data, designing an experiment, setting an econometric model, a causal inference model to answer properly the question is just a completely different matter and way more complex. While I can easily teach how to question causality, even with crash course in 15 minutes, 40 minutes to understand the concepts, it takes years, really years of hard work to actually do it properly and measure causal effects. So that's why I think for the moment, I doubt that uh, AI could do it uh, automatically. So thinking for a moment about the student who is not a PhD in causal inference, but hears this and says, this is really important and interesting, and I would like to learn how to measure causality, not only question it. What do we do short of telling them, go do a PhD? So 
That's a fantastic timing. Last week, I published a roadmap to learn causal inference on your own for free. So basically, in this roadmap that's uh, freely available on, on Towards Data Science, I go through the whole framework. You don't need any prerequisites. And I guide the people with free resources, which are, in my opinion, actually the best resources online, to learn it from your home for free. So the first thing you want to understand are the concepts of causal inference. What I just mentioned about parallel worlds and unconfoundedness. But this is the first thing you have to understand and the, di the difference with, with prediction inference. Once you understand the big picture, you need technical tools. And those technical tools, you have two types. First, you need to know a bit of statistics, typically linear regression. And second, you need typically some knowledge to implement those algorithms to go further. So typically Python, Stata, R, or whatever, SPSS maybe, I, I never used it. Once you have those first things, you can also formalize the big picture with the two main framework that works jointly, actually, the theoretical framework that helps to talk to with other people working in causal inference, to understand those concepts, to work properly and understand the books. And it's the, basically to learn how to draw graphs, causal graphs, directed acyclic graphs, and what we call the potential outcome model. So those are the two pieces, the theoretical piece you need to learn. In addition, the technical tools, statistics, and Python or whatever. And then you can basically go through the technical tools, models that helps to assess causal effects. And usually you go in the following order. You start with the example of randomized control trial, which is now widely used in the industry called mostly A-B testing with online platforms. You can go through this and go through other methods when randomized control trials are not possible or not ideal. And uh, what we call quasi-experimental methods. And here, my recommendation is to learn at least the three following regression discontinuity design, diff and diff, and uh, instrumental variable. If you follow this path, which honestly you can do from your own by reading the book, the resources, playing with the code I share in the, in the guide, I think that in one semester or one year, if you work hard, uh, maybe on one semester, six months, you can already create kind of some projects, some portfolio projects and include this in your practice. So that's the beauty of the internet, right? It's really, you have all this knowledge that's freely available with tools like Python that anyone can use. It's not like Stata, it's thousands of dollars every year. It's really, you, you can start now and access this knowledge from the very best in causal inference. So I mostly cite two books, online uh, free ebook uh, from Mateus Fakure and Scott Cunningham, right? They are, they are just brilliant people. Yeah, and the, the former book has an amazing Python code. Yes. <laughs> Very accessible. And I think the cool thing about causal inference, right, it's, it's something you need to sit down and think about. It's not something you can just kind of half skim and expect to understand. But I think if you put in the effort to really think deeply about these concepts, it's really fascinating. And, and it's very, very powerful, but you just need to put in the work to understand it enough, I think, to appreciate it. True. And then you see that it's everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's really everywhere in every discussion you have. I see because I'm so obsessed with this. I, I see people when they talk to me, they always like think a second time. They tend to start talking and then they're like, yeah, but I know that it's not causal. But, and, and you see that actually you can have this re reflex to question everything, it really enrich the, the discussion. So it's very useful, in my opinion, for the job market, because even if you're not running, and we are going to discuss this afterwards in the second part and third part, but even in discussion, in meetings with your boss, with colleagues, when you discuss a decision, a business decision, it's central to use those tools to think. You don't have to run Python code but just to think about the concepts that are behind causal inference. What makes something causal and what allows you to question causality? So maybe this is a good segue into the second segment, causality for business owners and executives. 
So <laughs> in the <laughs> good transition. So that's something I was I'm focusing on now uh, doing consulting in what we call decision intelligence to try to make decisions and using those concepts. So typically, when you make a decision, you are a business leader, a top executive, a CEO, or just a leader of a team. Usually, you make a decision because you expect some consequence, or you make a decision because you observe that something affected something else. Maybe you did a decision in the past, it worked well, or it seems that it worked well. So all those things require causal inference. And that's, that's this important. It's really in every little aspects of the decisions. So sure, for most of those people, so, so you really have the two angles. Either you will be a data person, where you are going to apply the models and learn causal inference, or you will be someone who will interpret the data, be exposed to data and decisions. And here for this part, what usually I teach and what is useful in uh, causal inference are typically the framework, the logic, the big picture, and those concepts. So it, it will, and even broader than causal inference, is, it's in statistics. So let me give an example. The other day, someone was uh, complaining on LinkedIn or saying, well, you know, LinkedIn is just full of people who pretend they succeeded and then they just give a roadmap to what they did and say, okay, you'll succeed as well. And they, the person asks, uh, what do you see when you see those posts? And, and I answer the following. I see selection bias and uh, outcome bias. And just knowing those bias, which is very accessible for people who are not coding for anyone, it helps to see the world with a bit more skepticism and question it better. So what do I mean by what, what I just meant? So, First, you have the selection bias, which is the fact that the person who succeeded and show their success just select where they succeeded and not maybe mentioning all the failure. And you don't see potentially all the people who did the same thing and failed. So they're really selected. It's the same thing with the high school dropouts who were really successful. I'm not sure now, but maybe Mark Zuckerberg or maybe uh, Bill Gates. I am not sure again. But those people, it's, it, you cannot look at the result, at the outcome, and think if only by looking at the outcome that it's a good decision. That's called outcome bias, right? It's basically, if you need more information, you need to use the mass to see for other people what happens on average in subgroups as well. Because some terrible decision leads to, to great outcome just by chance, or because the person is really unique and not representative. And typically those, those concepts are things that should be taught to business leaders, business owners, to virtually anyone to, to make better decisions. Yeah, I think the selection bias and well, there's so many biases, right, that are really important. I, I guess I tend to think selection bias is maybe the most common one. But I was talking to someone just yesterday about these online, I guess, so-called money-making gurus who have a course and a method and claim that it works, right? And if only someone could implement the course on a big population and measure the outcomes, right? Of course, no one has that data or publishes that data if they have it, but that's what we would really want to have. Exactly, exactly. To see how does it work on average for other people, no, true. And you mentioned like, other type of bias, and I think for selection bias is a major one, but I would say the also another one that might be also considered as the main one is confirmation bias. It, it, we are all affected by confirmation bias. It's the fact, just to be sure that it's clear for everyone, is the fact that you tend to select the information, give more credit to some part of the information and remember well some piece of information that will just reinforce your belief, your prior belief, things that you are satisfied with. I know that I'm also affected by this, but again, just knowing it, being conscious about it helps a lot already. It helps to try to fight against this. So for example, what I talk a lot with my students for confirmation bias is really Typically, as you are conscious of this, you try to have other people who have different views, political views or whatever, 
and you are able to have a, an open discussion with them. And also trying to actually destroy your own opinion, like what will be the piece of evidence that will make me change my mind? And you look for those evidence. And only good things can happen. If you find the information that you are looking for, well, good. It's a good thing to change your mind. It's not a problem. It's really good. Sometimes, sometimes people like <laughs> think that it's, it's bad, right? But it's, it's really good thing to be able to change your mind. And if you don't find it, it will just reinforce your belief, but with more certainty and, and validity. I love that example of what piece of information would change my opinion on this topic. Because as you said, if you don't find it, you you just have a better informed opinion. Well, and if you change your mind, well, maybe you had to change your mind. So going back to a business context, how should someone who's not technical, but is an executive who makes decisions on a daily basis, think about it? I guess from two sides. One is what should I be reading or thinking about to have a more causal mindset in general? And number two, what questions should I be asking my data science team to make sure they know not only how to think about causality, but also how to measure it properly? Yes. So, so you said something wonderful, and very, very useful that I, I want first to address this. You don't need to be an expert to question an expert. And typically with those tools, you don't need to be the expert in causal inference and the data person in the company that collected the data, analyzed the data, find the results to question them properly with very key questions. As I said, you can do this very well. It's another thing to measure causal effects, but this is very accessible. So, so your example is spot on. And that's really something that we can invite the audience and business owners to, to empower them. They, they will be able to ask the, the right questions. So the main things are really having this key concept, key idea that ideally we need parallel worlds to measure something to measure situation, things about, think your Netflix, you think that, well, we should change our home page instead of uh, showing people the latest movies when you open the page. Let's now show them the biggest success, so things that people watch now. And you're not sure if it's a good choice or not. So what you could do is you implement it for next month and you check out uh, retention, subscriptions, sales, whatever, change. The thing is, you're not in a parallel world. You're doing something at another point in time. So maybe other stuff change that are confounded. Maybe the weather changed. Maybe it was a really rainy month when you changed this. And basically, that's the first tool I always share is first think about the parallel worlds and, and why you, in your situation, what are the differences with this ideal situation? Typically, in the example I just took, it's the same platform, but different points in time. So what, so what is changing di di between those months? And then once you capture this, you ask the question, is there something else? Basically, <laughs> omitted variable bias, but uh, uh, confounding effects. But without technicality, you can just teach people, always ask when you hear a causal claim, is there something else explaining this relationship? So with the Netflix, you have fewer sales. Is it because of our own page or because it was uh, very sunny? So fewer people were watching the platform and watching movies and, and whatever. And then typically if you're a business owner or leader, executive, and you're talking with, you see a report, you can ask this question to the data people, right? You can say, did you take seasonality? How do you address the fact that maybe it's affected by the weather? And then the person has to convince you. You don't need yourself to know how to do it technically. You have, but the person in front should be able to convince you that they took this into account. Or why is it not a problem? And maybe one thing to think about too, because of the fact that we can't prove causality and we can't measure out of sample test performance. For example, with predictive models, executives will often ask, what's the performance of the model? Here, we don't have a performance. But one thing that the data scientists could do is to have slightly different ways of measuring the causal effect. Maybe we are looking at, I don't know, the price sensitivity of our customers. And so we have a causal estimate. But how do we gain confidence in that? Well, maybe we look at two different subpopulations 
and we see if the differences in the estimate align with intuitions. Maybe we have um, higher income customers are less price sensitive, right? If that's what we find, that makes sense. If we find the opposite, then maybe we are should question the framework a little bit more. Yes, indeed. So you point to a, a key concept in causality. Usually you have key concepts like also uh, the consequence usually takes place after the cause, but also something that you mentioned that is key in causal inference is the rationale. Why do you expect this to happen and why do you expect it to have this sign? In medical research, it's really a foundation before running the experiment. You should really claim, explain your hypothesis and what is the medical rationale behind? Why do you expect that cold exposure will boost your immune system? And actually, I, I don't take this example by chance, randomly. It's because you don't have a clear rationale in medical research why you would expect this. You have some discussion, but it's really not clear. And typically in the research on cold exposure, that's a, a big missing part. What would explain exactly this? So you have, I won't explain it here, but you, you have some rationale, but it's really discussed and, and not that clear at all. And usually you need this piece to be sure why do you, you expect the positive effect, you find it, and also you have the whole framework that uh, ensure that you did things properly and not just, again, confirmation bias. You just want to prove something, a new test, and you show that it's there. I am very intrigued now. I'm a big fan of cold exposure. I actually have a cold plunge that I jump into every morning. I guess with cold exposure, the thing that's good about measuring the effects of it is that you can actually do a randomized controlled trial, right? Like we can put people in a cold plunge randomly. Let's talk about this example that I love because I also love the cold. I did a lot of cold exposure, Wim Hof methods, and I was also swimming long distance uh, swimming in, in cold water. And um, let me tell you the, the full story. And again, uh, just my two cents as of today. If you go on Google, it, it's actually a paper that I've heard on uh, Nat Geo the first time, but if you go on Google and you type cold exposure and sick leave, work sick leave, the first paper you will get tons of reference to is a paper done in the Netherlands a few years ago with something like 4,000 participants. And it is in the title, as you really clearly suggested, it's written, it's a randomized control trial. But the thing is, so basically what happened, the bottom line in their finding, they randomized uh, the thousands of people in four groups, one without cold exposure, but shower every day. And the three others are shower every day, but uh, finishing the shower with a cold exposure of something like, I'm not sure now, but I would say 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and one minute and a half, or 30 seconds. No, it's 30 seconds, one minute, and one minute and a half. And basically the main result is that the people who were exposed to the cold had a third fewer, a reduction of a third of the sick leave for work. So massive effect size. The, the main thing, you have two issues with this randomized control trial. The thing is you cannot blind people. Usually what I mean by blinding is a, it's one of the property randomized control trial. You want to prevent people knowing if they take the pill or not, the treatment or the control. You know when you take a cold shower, right? It's impossible to hide. <laughs> And you don't have any way to circumvent this. So then, that's why usually in medical research, you will give a placebo. It's to avoid the placebo effect. But then we'll talk about, few, you have fewer level, uh, several level. So if it's just a placebo effect, because you expect it to work, you know the rationale that it boosts your immune system, maybe you just feel stronger, even, even if it's just in your head, you just feel, okay, I can endure cold shower every day, so now I can go to work because I, even if I'm sick, that's not really a problem. That's a good thing to know, right? It, it's useful. Even if it's just placebo, it's useful. But the thing is, it's a bit worse than this. In this paper, to this scale for specifically cold exposure, the, everything was self-reported. So then it, really, it leads to another layer and another bias that's useful to know. That's called uh, a desirability bias. People like to be liked. They know what we expect from them when they are exposed to cold. So maybe this affected the way they report, the way they behave, just because 
Maybe there are no effects. Maybe they feel terrible, <laughs> but they just wanted during the study to go to work due to this bias. So, and the bottom line is also, we still struggle to know exactly the rationale why we would expect this increase in, in the immune system response. There are some discussion like decoupling and different things, but, but well, that's basically the, typically all the, the things I did here, I did it without any math, right? It's typically the tools that I, I use. So anybody, a business owner, uh, anyone who wants a bit, to put a bit of effort could literally look at scientific research and question it just as I did. That's why I, I find it fantastic and so beautiful because it's really actually, it's really useful and could be made accessible. And so I think this is a great example and transition into our final part, which is causal inference for everyone. And I love this example because, and I think just to clarify, we are not saying that cold exposure is bad, right? But you are showing how do you assess a scientific study that claims a certain causal mechanism of how cold exposure would affect the immune system. And if you think about it, thinking in this causal way is useful for, I would say, most decisions you will be making in your everyday life. So do you have any examples just for the average person who thinks, well, why would I really want to think about it this like that? I try to think about an uh, example, but let, let me just uh, react to, to what you said. It's very important because sometimes when I talk about this, people get their message wrong. The fact that you can question, as you said, does not say that the effect is not there, that it's not the truth. It says you need something else to be very sure, to have a higher level of confidence. I'm not saying at any point, and you're right to point this, that cold exposure is not working. It's not this type of evidence that I mentioned has some weaknesses. And actually, you could try to address those weaknesses. So what I mentioned was that the fact that you have behavioral bias, people will change their behavior in such a way that you're not sure if it's just them biasing the result or if the result is there. And how do you fix this? Well, you measure things that people cannot control. So it could be some, and I had discussion on LinkedIn about this and debating about people in medical research. You could try to measure things it's not self-reported. It's really like temperature, uh, some blood sample to, to capture different indicators that people will not be able to, to manipulate. So most of the time, I have all those critics, but we also have some way to fix it. It's not just, well, it's too complicated and you'll never be able to know. No, it's not that. You usually can achieve uh, the right approach and also related to, to the broad audience, most of the time, I mean, we don't, we are not able to run a randomized control trial for all our decisions, right? I, I always take this with my, my children. I mean, they are crying <laughs> in the evening because there are something wrong. We are trying to help them uh, find their sleep. Uh, I'm not going to go on Google and look all the randomized control trials. Should I go and, uh, and comfort her or let her five minutes cry? Uh, it doesn't work like this. So it's necessary to also be able to make decision without clean, perfect setup, which is what we do most of the time. But at least to have these small like red flags, okay, maybe this is, there is a big risk here, or there is no risk or little risk here that it's causal. It helps, it helps tremendously to, to make better decisions. With voting, I mean, populist parties, Politicians are experts to mislead people using some evidence. You show graph, things are moving together, and you conclude that it's causal. And then you build a whole narrative. And typically, those tools should help anyone to, to be, wait a minute, is there something else? Is there something else explaining this? And then you start seeing that <laughs> way too many people are way too confident about what they are saying. <laughs> And I think this is really something, I mean, in, in Switzerland, we vote for laws, political decision every other month, maybe a few times per, per year. And you have political campaigns that are really known to be really abusive and misleading. But if you have those tools again, and if you are willing to think by yourself, I think it can really help in those situations. Or journalists, we were talking about anyone. I mean, journalists, you have an interview, 
it, it's not possible to fact check everything. It takes time and it re requires also that the answer exists somewhere. It's not always the case, but if you're able at least to just think like this, even live during an interview, it, it, it could be useful. Should think about other examples, but uh, I, I don't have exactly now. Maybe you. Yeah, and but I think you touched on a key thing, right? You said you need to have the willingness to adopt this mindset, and I think it because of the confirmation bias, it can feel very threatening to try to question one's beliefs, right? Maybe we see two things move together, right? Some, I don't know, economic indicator, there's a story tied to it of whose fault it is. And we're very attached to that story. But I think one thing that should motivate people to be more, I guess, use critical thinking more, right? That's really what it's all about is that in the end, if you get the causality wrong, there's a chance you end up hurting yourself because you adopt a policy that's actually not working and may even be counterproductive. Yeah, exactly. That's that's totally true. So, so with the example of daily life, it made me think uh, what, what you mentioned. I have those examples every day because I always think about this. But for example, I have my, my coach, my fitness coach, who told me uh, I, I was preparing for a race and uh, I had one of the steps was doing the rowing machine during this particular fitness event. And the, my coach told me, okay, you need to follow my protocol for a month. You test today for one kilometer, uh, max effort, and you test again in, in one month. <laughs> and directly, I was like, but how do you know <laughs> if there is a difference? There are so many factors. Maybe I slept better. Maybe I will be a placebo effect. I really want it to work. Maybe today I will set a, a, a mark. So then it's way easier to beat this mark because I have a reference point. Maybe I changed my diet. Maybe I did other exercise that crossed, helped me with the cross training. So then we had this very rich discussion about, about this. And that's typically a, a thing that is useful. And again, most of the time, it will help to think better and find solutions to address this. Uh, so, for example, testing repeatedly for, for athletes, you could, again, measure things that you cannot uh, trick, like physiological response or capacity to to have oxygen in your blood. So many things that you could do, but at the individual level, you can also just think better. Okay, is there really something that might affect significantly this result or, or could I be confident that, that there is an effect? And yeah, those things are, are, are really everyday life useful with situation that, that helps to, to, to think better. Not to get into discussions about, say, diet and exercise specifically, because it's such a complex topic, right? But I think most people care about feeling good, and they look for advice about, say, exercise and nutrition that's going to help them optimize health and well-being. But the body is a complex system, right? So it's extra hard to pinpoint causality, but of course, there's a lot of people out there with incentives selling a certain program or a diet. And that's where exactly where you should be questioning, right? And again, I'm not saying that people are lying to you, but just be skeptical. Like, why is this thing working? Why can you be confident in it? It's perfectly related to usually the second concept I teach. Next to, is there something else? I like to, call, to talk about, can we extrapolate? So the external validity, technically speaking. So basically, something can be very robust, properly made with a randomized control trial, very clean, on a small sample at one point in time in a, with some person, but it might not work at another point in time in another part of the world. And this is always something we, sh we should question. I mean, in medical research, historically, we have done medical research mostly on male pa patients. And there were several reasons for this but mostly some good, some, some questionable. And, so, but there is a clear issue <laughs> that's so evident. So that one of the reasons was actually that menstrual cycle increased the variability of the response to drugs. And hence you need a larger sample because it's more noisy to observe your effect. Larger sample me means what? More money, more time. So to save money, arguably, people focused on, on the male population as passion. And what happens is, at, at the end of the 90s, in the US, eight out of 10 drugs withdrawn from the market 
have been withdrawn due to side effects found only for women or mostly for women. Of course, if you focused on half of the population, you cannot expect necessarily, and you never study this, but it will be the same for the other half. Most importantly, because you know actually here that there is a factor, uh, hormones and, and menstrual cycle here, that affects the response to the treatment, but you refuse to, to test it. So this is about external validity. And this is another concept that I, I think that's really useful to question. Something might have worked in the 80s, maybe not today, because something changed. Maybe, and, and in research, even you have a famous paper in Nature called Most People Are Not Weird. And the weird is uh, actually uh, an acronym for Western, educated, and I'm not sure, white, or I'm not sure, because most of the research focus on those people. And then basically you conclude that it might work, but, but not necessarily. You have lots of people, if not the majority, which the vast majority actually, that will not fit this definition. So yeah, that's, a, that's a, also a very important point that, that you mentioned. And I think these kinds of examples speak to people, right? Because they can be understood by anyone. And earlier, you mentioned some of the research areas that you have worked in related to policy. And I think you mentioned COVID and a few other things. Do you have any examples from your research that are related to policy that you think people might find interesting? Yes. So typically, sometimes you have the things that affects both at the same time, what we call reverse causation. And that's one of the, it's very tricky to solve this issue. And that's one of the main issues I, I faced with uh, two of my main papers. One, I worked seven years measuring the effect of sending weapons in Africa on the probability of conflict, on the intensity of conflict and the refugee flows. And the, the main issue is that many people will say, well, we know if you have weapons, more violence, it creates issues, right? But then the thing, if you miss this proof, causal proof, you always have lobbyists, arms, weapons exporters and producers that then can say, well, you know, it's just a correlation. When you have a conflict, you have more imports, more weapons, because there is a conflict. If you don't send weapons, people will kill each other with machetes, with other white weapons or all other things, which is actually not true <laughs> in the sense that weapons are so efficient that indeed, and it's what I found in this paper, it increased the, the probability of conflict, the intensity and the people fleeing the, the, the country. But without this evidence, it misses a piece also to enforce laws. So you have several frameworks to, to protect this and control arms trade, but it, it really missed this, this piece. And that's typically when it was useful to, to bring additional evidence and robust evidence about, about this and causal evidence. It was the same with COVID, you know, at the beginning of the lockdowns. And COVID is a very tricky situation, uh, very tricky for many reasons. Why do you need causal inference? You can have relatively robust anecdotal evidence that lockdowns reduce the, the spread of the virus, but you don't want to know if it reduces only. You need to know exactly the magnitude. And that's where you need causal inference to have a precise estimate. Why? Because lockdowns are potentially beneficial for, for, to reduce the spread of the virus, but they have many other costs, economic costs, social costs, psychological costs. So you want to be sure that when you put this in the balance, you, you're doing the right decision. The benefits will be larger than the costs. And so we worked a few years on this, and at the beginning, I, I really remember people showing graphs with data, showing that basically where you have the most stringent lockdown measures, you had more cases. And they really used this piece of evidence, not evidence, but this, this measure to say, well, it's counterproductive. And the thing is, clearly, it's going in the other direction, mainly. It's the fact that the situation is terrible in a country, in a region, that you enforce a very stringent measure so if you look at one point in time, you don't see this. But of course, you need to look how it's changing over time within each places, which is what we did to make things simple in, my, in, in our paper. But we did many other things to get rid of the potential confounding effects. 
And I think it's so important to think about the cost-benefit analysis when thinking about, well, really most policies, right? Like COVID or climate or health measures, because as economists, we know that there's almost always a trade-off, right? Like we don't have infinite resources. And not only is there a trade-off today, but there could also be long-term effects, right? So maybe with lockdowns, if you lock down, then there isn't a spread, but people don't get immunity. And then when you, you stop the lockdown, there is more COVID than there would have been or something like that, right? Which is very tricky to measure. Very tricky to measure. Indeed, here, we didn't have the perfect setup. We were honestly able, in my opinion, that's the paper approaching the closest causality. We worked with maybe, I'm not sure now, but about one year of data worldwide. And we took many other issues like geography, health sector quality, population size, population like pyramids, if you have a more elderly, many factors, like even the fact that you you have measurement errors, basically you don't measure people who have COVID, you measure people who tested positive. And it, it's vastly different. So we took this into account with different uh, measures. So we tried to approach uh, this evidence. But as you mentioned, I think that's also a concept. So that's key concept again. It's it's almost everything, at least related to humans, are multifactorial. And it's really important to understand when you think about causal inference, because some people will be like, well, I identified this cause, so your cause is wrong. No, they, they could be both correct at the same time. And most of the time, it's the case. You try to identify one cause, it will not necessarily invalidate the others. I mean, if we think about my paper on weapons and conflicts, you have tons of, of reason when you have a conflict, from economic to social to religious to weather shocks and basically related to economic and health. But that does not prevent that to identify one of the effects and to isolate these effects. Because I'm mentioning this because I saw many debates between people getting really angry and a heated debate, but actually both could be right at the same time, just different causes that coexist. Yeah, and I think that's a very important mindset to have, that two things can be true at the same time. Very often things are pitched as a dichotomy, like it's either this or that, and more often than not, it's nuanced. Maybe I, I just have it in mind. One example that I took with my class at length Tuesday, yesterday, was about wage discrimination between women and men. It was really interesting because with causal inference, you can really dive into this and understand what are the tools that people use to debate about it and discredit the, the findings that you have uh, discrimination. And basically, when you think about it, you, you are able to understand all those things. So the main problem is that you can say that you have a correlation between women and today, not talking about the cause, it could be a social constraint, could be imposed by many things, but you can observe that just given the statistics, you have more part-time women working part-time with uh, lower responsibility, lower risk, lower movement, and all those things are, are not rewarded on the job market. So then people, basically the issue is that the sign of the effect, it's in the same direction. If you work less, you earn less. And if you have discrimination, you will earn less. So then the issue is that actually the, the two are confounded because they go in the same direction. That's what you call an amplification bias. It's going in the same sign. So it allows for the debate. If it was in the other direction, opposite direction, there will be no debate. And those things help to, to think about those mechanisms, why you still have a debate and, and why it's hard to disentangle all the factors. Just to be sure that it's clear, because I know that it's a kind of a sensitive debate today. Sure, it's go way beyond just wage discrimination. You have even the access to the position that's discriminated. So then if you just do kind of a simple comparison between the people at a position with other at the same position, well, maybe those, maybe women didn't even have the chance to reach some level of hierarchy or some positions. And for this, actually, you have other type of models uh, related well, in causal inference to do this. You have selections model that measure exactly this, the barrier to entry and, and that can add the penalty when you look at wage discrimination, like two-stage Ekman model. 
the additional penalty due to the fact that you maybe you don't even access to the job. So I think th those things are typically, well, daily life things that you hear debated that help you to think about it. And for someone who isn't a technical causal inference expert, but would like to have some more judgment when they say hear a news story or read an article, would you say a good test is, suppose it's a news article, right? So the journalist is not a causal inference expert, but the questions to ask would be, are they going beyond just showing a chart where two things are correlated to draw conclusions? Do they have some extensive reasoning where they question different explanations? Are they referring to scientific literature, right? I think if you're going to write about, say, the effects of discrimination on wages or something as complex as that, you really should do your homework and go look at the literature that talks about that, right? Yes, totally. So those questions are useful. Uh, if I, I mentioned really, as we said together, is there something else finding? Is, is there an alternative explanation that has been like taken into account or not? Uh, this is very, very useful, in my opinion. Can you extrapolate? And indeed, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly skeptical <laughs> by every, about everything because I know that it's so complex. So, so actually, I, but I always all tell that this also. So it's, uh, I will be skeptical about everything, uh, even if it's a science peer reviewed, uh, like published in, in science or nature top scientific journals. But sure, my level of skepticism is different compared to an influencer on Instagram or TikTok. It, it just, <laughs> I will give less credit to start with, uh, given the source. So it's still related to fact checking, fact checking. But usually if I have the time, I will always try to go as deep as, as I said, with the example of the cold shower exposure. I hear this in the <laughs> documentary. I look on the internet. I find the paper. I read the paper. I question the paper. And sure, this is not maybe accessible to most of the people, but but that's also why I built the app because you can give the the report to ChatGPT to my app basically, and it it will raise some point and help you think and, and question. This is maybe a good note to end on. I guess for one, um, we are going to link to all the resources you mentioned regarding your work and what you offer in terms of services. Is there anything you would like to say if there's someone who's listening and maybe is in need of consulting, runs a business? Thanks a lot for, for suggesting. So yes, let, let's share it because I have ton of freely available content. And indeed, so basically now I'm indeed focusing on, on advice and, and helping leaders make better decisions. So I'm doing, they can reach out. I'm very active on LinkedIn mostly. So they can reach out directly there and I'll answer to every message to discuss if my expertise can be useful for them and how and what it will represent. So thank you very much for, for the invitation, for this exciting chat. It's always a pleasure to, to share and discuss about causality. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This was super fun.